Glory to Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Today is the feast of the optional memorial of St. Maria Goretti, the 6th of July, in the 13th week of Ordinary Time, which I think is the 4th week of, of Trinity, and the 5th week after Pentecost. But I may be wrong about those. <clears throat> so let's pray the prayer to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, fill our minds and hearts with the fire of the Holy Spirit so that we may serve you in purity of body and please you in cleanness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, may the holy paraclete who proceeds from you enlighten our minds and lead us to all truth, as your Son is promised through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, may the Holy Spirit cleanse our consciences by his coming, so that when your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, comes, he may find in us a dwelling place prepared for him through Christ our Lord. Amen. O Father, who through your Son did pour out the Holy Spirit in mid-morning upon the apostles gathered in prayer at Pentecost, the first Christian Pentecost, grant that we may truly grow in yielding to the Spirit, that we may grow in the gifts that you give in the Holy Spirit and ever produce the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, you picked up your cross in mid-morning on that first Good Friday so that you would die for our sake and then rise for our sake. Grant that we may have the grace ever to carry the crosses of our daily duty following you. We ask this of the Father in your name and the power of the Holy Spirit with whom you are one God forever and ever. Amen. O God, come to my assistance. O Lord, make haste to help me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Be patient in suffering. Be constant in prayer. Romans 12, 12. Psalm 120. I cried out, and the Lord heard me. I cried out, and the Lord heard me. To the Lord in the hour of my distress, I call, and he answers me. O Lord, save my soul from lying lips, from the tongue of the deceitful. What shall he pay you in return, O treacherous tongue? The warrior's arrow sharpened and coals red-hot blazing. Alas, that I abide a stranger in Meshech and dwell among the tents of Kedar. Long enough have I been dwelling with those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for fighting. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I cried out, and the Lord heard me. May the Lord watch over you as you come and as you go. Psalm 121. O Lord, be guardian of your people. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall come my help? My help shall come from the Lord who made heaven and earth. May he never allow you to stumble. Let him sleep not your guard. No, he sleeps not nor slumbers, Israel's guard. The Lord is at your guard and your shade, 
At your right side he stands. By day the sun shall not smite you, nor the moon in the night. The Lord will guard you from evil. He will guard your soul. The Lord will guard your going and coming both now and forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. May the Lord watch over you as you come and as you go. May the Lord watch over you as you come and as you go. I rejoiced in the good news they told me. Psalm 122. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 22. I rejoice when I heard them say, let us go to God's house. And now our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city strongly compact. It is there that the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. For Israel's law it is. They to praise the Lord's name. They were set the thrones of judgment of the house of David. For the peace of Jerusalem pray, peace be to your homes. May peace reign in your walls and your palaces peace. For love of my brethren and friends, I say peace upon you. For love of the house of the Lord, I will ask for your good. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I rejoiced in the good news they told me. I rejoiced in the good news they told me. A reading from Romans 8. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Trial or distress or persecution or hunger or nakedness or danger or the sword? Yet in all this we are more than conquerors because of him who has loved us. For I am certain that neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities, neither the present nor the future nor powers, Neither height nor depth nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God that comes to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. From 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 3 to 5. Praise be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies, and the God of all consolation. He comforts us in all our afflictions, and thus enables us to comfort those who are in trouble with the same consolation we have received from him. For we have shared much in the suffering of Christ. So through Christ, we share abundantly in his consolation. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to God, for this is the wedding day of the Lamb. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to God, for this is the wedding day of the Lamb. I will give the victor the right to sit with me on my throne, as I myself won the victory and took my seat beside my father on his throne. I will give the victor the right to sit with me on my throne, as I myself won the victory and took my seat beside my father on his throne. You will know sorrow, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. You will know sorrow, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Let us pray.
O God, author of innocence and lover of chastity, you bestowed the grace of martyrdom on your handmaid, the Virgin Saint Maria Goretti, in her youth. Grant, we pray, that through her intercession, that as you gave her a crown in her steadfastness, so we too may be firm in obeying your commandments, to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as we just prayed, today, July 6th, is the optional memorial of St. Maria Goretti, Virgin and Martyr, born near Ancona in Italy to a poor peasant family. She lived from 1890 to 1902, so she was 12 years old when she was murdered. She was known for her cheerfulness and piety. At 12 years old, she was stabbed to death by a young man for resisting his attempts to seduce her. He later re she forgave him with her last breath. She later re he later reformed his life completely and was present at her canonization in 1950 and said that he had she had appeared to him because he was actually very bitter initially in jail and then had this conversion experience through her prayers. And if my head weren't attached, I would have left it somewhere. I left my iPad upstairs. So say an hour, Father, a hill, Mary, and a glory be, and I'll be back. So we're going to look up what other saints are being commemorated in the various calendars in the church. Thing will come up. So we press the Laudate app icon, which is a key role of an Alpha and Omega. And, uh-oh, may not be working today. See, ah, so blessed Nasaria Inyasa March Imesa. Or Nasaria Inyasia de Santa Teresa de Jesus. She was the fourth of 18 children. born in Madrid, Spain, in 1899. She died on July 6, 1943, in a hospital in Buenos Aires of complications from pneumonia and tuberculosis. And uh, when she made her first communion in 19, 1898, she felt a real call to the religious life. And it said she made a personal secret vow of consecration to God. Her family was actually indifferent to the faith and grew so tired of her devotions that they once grounded her from going to mass. 
by the time she was confirmed in 1902. Which were, she was confirmed by a blessed, blessed Marcelo Spinole y Maestre. Her family had grown used to her piety and allowed her to join the Franciscan Third Order, the secular order for lay people, and more actively practice her faith. She succeeded in, in getting several of her family to return to going to Mass and participating in the spiritual life. In 1904, the family moved to Mexico, and there she met the Hermanites de los Ancianos Desamparados, the Institute of the Sisters of Abandoned Elders, to take care of, of the uh, abandoned uh, elderly poor. And so she joined them in uh, 1908 and made her vows in 1915. And her diary said she had struggles with vows of obedience to her superiors. I could tell you what that's like. Well, so she was sent to the to Aurora in Bolivia, where Father Tom Domerat. Uh, served uh, 10 years uh, in the Society of St. James the Apostle, where she worked as a cook, a housekeeper, a nurse, and an occasional beggar to support the poor. She was very concerned about the neglected uh, elderly poor. Beginning in 1920, she felt a call to found a new congregation devoted to home missionary work there in Bolivia, especially to counteract the growing uh, Protestant missions that were, quote unquote, sheep stealing, and also the lack of education that so many people saw. Their faith was so mixed with pre-Christian uh, superstitions and other things. She was very concerned about this. So she started this group in 1925 called the Missionary Crusaders of the Church. The mission of the congregation was to catechize not only children but adults, support the work of priests, conduct missions, and to print and distribute short religious tracts as well as to uh, care for the poor and the elderly. She was met with opposition from her work, as much from within the church administration as from outside. And when she left the other institute, she was treated as a traitor. And, uh, and the superiors considered her disobedient. But she clung to Christ and pressed on. So uh, they entered a house in they started a house in 1930 in Buenos Aires, and to uh, and uh, she sought to be a peacemaker in the war between Paraguay and Bolivia from 1932 to 1935. She founded the first female trade union the Society of Catholic Workers. And uh, so she went to Italy to get her things going there and recognition. And then she went to her native Spain and founded a retreat center there in Madrid. Under the flag of Uruguay, the sisters there survived the Spanish Civil War because the uh, various uh, anarchist and communist groups did, didn't want to provoke an international incident since they were uh, flying under the flag of Uruguay. So they, so they were not, unlike many women religious, they weren't killed in the Spanish Civil War, murdered. 
Margaret. So she went back to uh, back to South America, and her group had opened houses in Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, and then in Cameroon in Africa. And so she died on the 6th of July, 1943, in Buenos Aires of complications from pneumonia and TB. And she was buried in the mother house of the congregation in Oruro, Bolivia in 1972. Thomas Al Field, alias Thomas Badger. He was uh, martyred in, uh, eight, in 1585 under Elizabeth I for his priesthood and given uh, the, uh, the horrible death of being hanged, drawn, and quartered. This is basically being cut to pieces alive. Uh, he was born in Gloucester in England and studied in the best schools at Eton and then in King's College in Cambridge. And he was raised Protestant, but through his studies of history and scripture, he converted as an adult to Catholicism, which was illegal. He entered the seminary at Douay and Rance, which could be a potential death penalty if he came back and ministered in England. And he was ordained in 1581. He returned to England secretly to minister to the Catholics there during this period of persecution, working in the north of England. He was arrested, tortured in order to get information for him and sent to the Tower of London in 1582. He succumbed to the tortures and renounced his conversion to Catholicism and expressed a desire to return to the Anglican Church, and was released. Riddled with guilt over his failure to keep the faith, he returned to Rance, was reconciled to the Church, and then returned to England. Arrested again, he was back in the Tower, then to Newgate Prison, condemned for treason, and executed for the crimes of priesthood, and distributing a booklet that defended the Catholic Church, called The True and Modest Defense. He was beatified in 1929. Let's see who else. Oh, Palladius. St. Palladius of Ireland, sometimes claimed, also claimed by Scotland. He had gone over there to uh, uh, St. Patrick. We all know St. Patrick in the 5th century. Uh, wanted to be sent as the missionary bishop to Ireland but he was passed over for Palladius. Now, Palladius did not know much about Ireland. He didn't know the, the whole system, the clan system, all that. I don't think he knew Gaelic, although he was Gallo-Roman, he may have spoke, spoken Gaulish, I don't know, but chances only Latin. And he had been a deacon in Rome and was sent along with St. Germanus of Osea to Britain about Pelagianism, which says you don't really need grace to be saved. Uh, God just uh, rewards you for your good deeds. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which was condemned by the church. Ironically, we're accused of teaching that by Calvinists and some other uh, uh, faith alone Protestants. Uh, even though it was the Catholic Church that condemned Pelagianism. So, so, so he was chosen in 431 to be the missionary bishop for Ireland by Pope St. Celestine I. And so he was there in Leinster and he built three churches. He had a f converted very few people, had a great deal of opposition, and he became very discouraged. And, uh, but he plowed the ground for St. Patrick. He prepared that. And he left uh, discouraged, not knowing that the seeds he had planted would bring a great harvest. So he went off to uh, Britain 
to probably where, uh, probably in what is now Scotland. And uh, he even wanted to evangelize the Picts, but he died soon after. And he doesn't seem to have had great success there either. His biography was written by St. Prosper of Aquitaine. He died in 432 in Fordham in Scotland of natural causes. His relics were put in a jewel-encrusted sarcophagus in 1409, which I believe was pillaged during the Reformation, and I don't know if his relics survived uh, the uh, iconoclasm uh, of the Calvinists. Blessed Maria Theresia Ledovkovska, born to Austrian nobility, the daughter of count, a count and a countess, who were known as intensely pious people. But Maria's father died of smallpox when she was 22. So she turned to God for answers and began a spiritual move that would define the rest of her life. She devoted herself to supporting missionaries and fighting against slavery writing, publishing, traveling, and speaking, and fundraising endlessly. She was the founder of the Missionary Sisters of St. Peter Claver, who had a ministry to the slaves. She was born in 1863 and died in 1922 in Rome of natural causes. and was beatified by Pope Paul VI in 1975. Blessed Suzanne Agathe Delois, or Maria Rosa de Lois. She was a Benedictine nun in Cadarouze in France. In 1762, she took her vows, taking the name of Mary Rose. Expelled from the convent during the French Revolution, she was imprisoned and then executed during the persecutions of the French Revolution. She was the first of the Mar Martyrs of Orange, in France. She was born in 1741 and was guillotined on the 6th of July 1794 at Orange in France and beatified in 1925. Blessed Augustin Joseph Desgardins, Joseph August, Augustine Joseph Desgardins. Uh, he was a Trappist monk, who was, there was a Cistercian before him, imprisoned, a contemplative, uh, imprisoned on an old ship during the anti-Catholic excesses of the French Revolution. He was one of the martyrs of the Hulks of Rochford. He spent his time there caring for sick fellow prisoners. He himself got sick uh, and died in, on 6th of July, 1794, of sickness and mistreatment aboard the prison ship De Associés in Rochefort, in Charente-Maritime, in France. It was beatified by Pope John Paul II in 1995. And Peter Wang Jo Lung by Duo. He was a layman in southeastern China and was seized by anti-Christian forces during the Boxer Rebellion and uh, was ordered to renounce uh, the foreign devils and to renounce Christianity as alien. He was dragged in front of uh, statues, uh, I think they were Taoist gods, and ordered to renounce Christianity, and when he refused, and to honor them, to uh, uh, and he refused, and they killed him. That was on the sixth of July, nineteen hundred, in Shuangzhong, Jizhou, Hebei, China, and he was beatified in nineteen ninety five. In nineteen fifty five, and canonized in the year two thousand, by Pope John Paul II.
So we will stop there. We'll stop there. And so there are plenty to look up, plenty of short lives of the saints there. So today is Our Lady of Akita, the Marian title, a, a, an apparition in Japan which was approved, which uh, there was a statue there of, of Mary with Japanese features uh, that began to weep. And there were miracles and all sorts of things involved in a religious sister received uh, private revelations. And that, of course, in, in this, like all the Marian apparitions, the call was to repentance, prayer, and uh, uh, love one another. And uh, seek for the conversion of society. And of course, in these private revelations, you don't have to accept them. You don't have to believe, believe them, uh, that they're authentic, even the ones that are approved. Of course, we're supposed to not believe the ones that are, are rejected by the church. And so let's look at the catechism for today. We're on uh, part four, uh, section four of part one, the canon of scripture, paragraph 120. <clears throat> it was by the apostolic tradition that the church discerned which writings are to be included in the list of sacred books. The complete list is called the canon of scripture. It includes 46 books of the Old Testament or 45 if you count Jeremiah and Lamentations as one, <coughs> which some editions of the, of the Bible have, <coughs> and 27 for the new. So the, the Protestants accept the 27 books that the Catholic slash Orthodox Church uh, defined as the books for the New Testament canon, but they rejected the Catholic Orthodox Old Testament canon Mostly, not always, not all uh, Protestant groups have rejected what they call the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonicals, what we call the Deuterocanonicals. So they're uh, books that were rejected by the Pharisees. Uh, so they were, they were thrown out of the Pharisee canon. So I mentioned before, there were a number of Jewish canons at the time. It hadn't been really solidified at the time of Christ, of... Uh, which canon was was the one, the proper one. There was the Sadducee, which only had the first five books. The, and the Samaritan also had the first five books. And then the other Palestinian canons, the Pharisee one, or sometimes called the Jamnian or the Masoretic uh, one. And they accepted many more books. They accepted most, uh, they accepted the prophets with the exception of uh, the uh, book of, let's see, the book of Baruch. I think they rejected Baruch, who was the scribe and uh, secretary of Jeremiah. And, uh, but uh, of the, of uh, the books called the writings, the ketuvim, the wisdom literature, they rejected six books and portions of other books. They rejected Tobit, Judith, First uh, and Second Maccabees, Ecclesiasticus, the wisdom of Solomon. Let's see, I think that's seven. So that's that. And um, why did with why did the product the most of the Protestant groups reject these. Well, they rejected what the Alexandrian canon, the non-Palestinian canon, which was widespread, which was the Septuagint, which was the translation and edition, uh, quoted most often in the New Testament by Jesus and the, and the authors of the New Testament. 
Jesus quoting of it was probably uh, he was probably saying it in Aramaic. Maybe he did say it in Greek, uh, which you know would have been the uh, a different edition, shall we say, than that. And because it was because of Second Maccabees that that they rejected the Judeo-Christian canon, which was widely accepted among the Jews and the diaspora outside of the Holy Land, and even probably in the Holy Land at the time of Christ and uh, a bit after. A good bit. In fact, it was uh, common as long as Greek was the lingua franca, the uh, main language uh, there in the, the Near East, uh, which was so until uh, a, a bit after the Arabic conquest, in fact, probably a century or so after the Arabic conquest. And then uh, Arabic became that language. So then the Septuagint was dropped and the uh, uh, just about all together by, by uh, non-Christian Jews. But the, uh, the Alexandrian canon was the canon accepted by the Christians. And there were, vari there were variants on it because the Orthodox Church had never really authoritatively defined what books uh, weren't in it. They accepted the same that the, the Latin Church accepted, uh, but there were some others which could well be, they thought. Uh, the uh, Third and Fourth Esdras, I believe, Third and Fourth Maccabees, the Prayer of Manasseh, so that, which is uh, uh, used liturgically in the Catholic Church in the Anglican use. Uh, and uh, uh, it rejected things like, you know, the, the, the uh, additions to, to Daniel, to things like the, the, the Hymn of the Three Young Men and things like that, which was used, again, liturgically in Anglicanism. Uh, so, uh, and the, re the big reason was, well, the a reason that was often given is that we're going to follow what the Jews of our day will follow. But if they were going to do that, they should have rejected the New Testament as well. Because the, the Jews really had no big problem with reading the deuterocanonical slash apocrypha as edifying reading, but they really did about the New Testament. So anyway, so the uh, so the Book of Maccabees, Second Maccabees to be specific, taught that it is fitting and right to pray for the dead. So that was a no-no in most forms of Protestantism, especially that you would help them through your prayer, the prayers afterwards. Uh, so they thought that more than implied purgatory and other things. So. And also, there's direct uh, intercession of uh, two martyred saints, Jeremiah and Onias the priest, for Jerusalem. And they're, they're killed, so, and they're praying. There's a vision of them uh, doing this. I think it was by Judah Maccabees. So, so that had to go, because if it was in the Bible, then there would be justification for the prayer of the dead and for the invocation of the saints. So, but to get rid of the second Maccabees, they really, to be consistent, had to get rid of all the Deuterocanonicals, which interestingly was in the original King James version, the 1611. It was in it until the, uh, the 18th century, and it was dropped not really for theologicalism, but for economy, that it, it was less expensive to print the Bible with that. Uh, I believe a number of Lutheran Bibles had it also, but they were usually put separately in their own section, quote unquote, in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, although there's really no in between because the Old Testament goes right into the New. So there's that of the canon of Scripture. So we follow the Alexandrian canon of Scripture, the fuller Bible, but we don't have we, did, we rejected some of the books that are often accepted in the uh, Orthodox churches. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church has the Book of Enoch, even, and, it, and other things. So they think of, uh, that's 
that. So the, the canon is accepted by the authority of the church, Jesus Christ through the church, that decides what books are in the Bible. So you can't really say you go our Bible alone uh, if you have uh, the books of the Bible, which because the, there are no claims inspired uh, frontispiece of the Bible that says this is the list of the books, the inspired books that will be put into the Bible. That doesn't exist. So to accept the, the books of the Bible, no matter whose tradition you go by, if you go by the Pharisee, the Alexandrian, or, or what, uh, you're going by a tradition outside the Bible. So, and since the Bible is a great source of doctrine, then you're uh, going outside the Bible for doctrine. If to say that it, to say that these books are inspired is a doctrinal statement. So, and to say they're not is a doctrinal statement. And since it's not in the Bible, then that's extra biblical. So much for Bible alone in the, in the literal strict sense. So, let's look at the Epistle of Jude. Epistle of Jude. So we're on chapter 14, and I just mentioned Enoch, I mean not chapter 14, verse 14. I just mentioned Enoch, and it mentions Enoch <coughs> here as uh, so Enoch of the seventh generation from Adam, he's mentioned in the book of Genesis, prophesied also about them when he said, this is not in the Bible. So uh, Jude, again, is quoting as an authoritative source uh, something doctrinally and morally authoritative, spiritually authoritative, something that's not in the canon of the Bible. Enoch of the seventh generation from Adam prophesied also about them when he said, Behold, the Lord is come with his countless holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict everyone for all the godless deeds they have committed and for all the harsh words Godless sinners have uttered against him. So this is a, it's about uh, punishment after death for unrepented sin. Judgment on all and to convict everyone for all the godless deeds that they have committed. And this is, would be godless deeds also after conversion if you don't repent of them. There's no footnote there in which Jude said, well, if you, uh, you know, experience a spiritual uh, revival, and then uh, after that, uh, all your sins are covered before, they're for pre forgiven pre beforehand, so you don't have to repent. So that, uh, which, thank God, is not really that common among once saved, always saved people. It is, unfortunately, uh, not uh, rare. Either. All you have to do is look on the internet to find that. So that attitude. So uh, these people are complainers, disgruntled ones who live by their desires. Their mouths utter bombast as they fawn over people to gain advantage. So this is... Uh, something uh, that if you, they're complainers. So this isn't just complaining. This isn't just, you know, everyday kvetching. This is really tearing down type of complaining that's uh, uh, talked about. And the uh, reference in Enoch is to an apocrypha book. I remember I talked about apocrypha. Well, there are these books that are called Old Testament pseudopigrapha, which means false writing. Uh, they're not in the canon, and they're not in uh, the canons, uh, the traditional Jewish canons. Oh, and there's also the Essene canon, I didn't mention that, which is actually speculative, uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which weren't all put in one book. They were in jars, in scrolls, and in fragments. So uh, they think, you know, in books like the uh, 
the battle of the sons of light and the sons of darkness and some other things. Maybe the Damascus document could have been in their canon that they had of their Bible, what they thought were inspired works. So the book of Enoch 1, 9, verse 9, is being referred to there. So let's pray our prayer of intercession. And the first people that pop, who, whose needs pop into our heads, let's present them to the Lord. For the church throughout the world, for unity among all the Christians, in doctrine, in love, especially, and in service. And may there be organic and true institutional unity and uh, true fraternity among Christians, even that when they disagree with each other. And for the Catholic Church, especially throughout the world, and for all places where Christians are persecuted and where anyone is persecuted for beliefs, for their ethnicity, for their identity with the religious group, where practice is not, is not there. And let's interrupt this, because the Angelus bells are just starting to ring at noontime. So let's pray the Angelus. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to your, thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth from beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ, thy Son, was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now back to the intercessions. So we were praying for the church where it's persecuted, Let's pray for the church where it is exhausted, where it is discouraged, where it doesn't, where it seems to be lukewarm and compromised, where it may have uh, people uh, corrupt in leadership, and uh, those uh, or people priests who are where the uh, the zealous for the faith. Leaders are oppressed by those outside the church and those within. For Francis, our Pope, and remember, Pope Francis is the true Pope. And for all his, his health, the body, mind, and spirit, for his direction, for, for a great prudence in what he says and does and, uh, and uh, that what he teaches may be well thought out. For our bishops, especially our own bishop, whoever that may be, 
and for all bishops, priests, and deacons, for all pastoral associates, for catechists, for volunteers in the church, for uh, ministers and pastors of the other churches, for all those who have ever ministered to us. For our families and the people in our families that first come to mind, let's present them to the Lord. Especially anyone in any trouble or grief or struggle. And the same for our friends, friends from long ago and current friends people who are just acquaintances and people who are real friends to us and people that we've found a disappointment in friendship and those who have found us disappointed in friendship and, though, and those who have been very good friends to us and those we've been good friends to. For our neighbors, our co-workers, uh, people who wait on us in, in shops and restaurants uh, and other places, people uh, we pass in the street, for our government. And for all the governments and leaders of government throughout the world, for our president, Congress, Supreme Court, our state legislatures, judiciaries, governors, mayors, and officials. And the same for all throughout the world, for prime ministers and parliaments, for our rulers, and especially for the conversion of heart of dictators and, and tyrants, especially those who oppress their people sorely, or, th or those who persecute their people, especially those who uh, lead in persecution of the church. That our government officials may strive zealously to defend and protect all human life, especially innocent human life, from conception to natural death and all the way in between. For our nation and all the nations and peoples of the world, especially where there's conflict and uh, where there is, there is violence, for the healing of society, for the overcoming of all bigotries, racial bigotries, ethnic bigotries, anti-Semitism, anti-Catholicism, anti-Christianity, anti-Muslim, uh, uh, anti, just about, especially when slanders are spread about people. For the healing of society morally, that through the intercession of Saint Maria Goretti and all the saints, especially those who live lives of great and even heroic chastity, for uh, the elevation of chastity in our society, and for the healing of families that have been uh, disrupted by unchastity. That we in this country and everywhere may treat each other the way we wish to be treated. And for live in, to struggle ceaselessly for liberty and justice for all. And that we may all exercise our duties if we wish to exercise our rights.
for all the sick, for those sick in body, mind, or spirit, especially those seriously ill, people with chronic illnesses, uh, those who are dying, especially those who will die today, for uh, people captured by addictions of bad behaviors, of self-destructive behaviors, of destructive behaviors, uh, or substances, addictive substances. For the lonely, the discouraged, the angry, the uh, grieving, for the poor, especially the destitute, for those of poverty of mind, body, and spirit, or spirit. For victims of war and oppression, of natural and man-made disasters, for refugees, for people who have been kidnapped, especially through the intercession of Saint Mary Goretti in Christ, for those uh, forced into the sex trade, for victims of rape and uh, sexual molestation. For those with sexually transmitted diseases. For justice and healing for all. For our deceased, our deceased ancestors, family, friends, neighbors, co-workers. For those who have died today or recently. And for all those who have died most in need of our prayers. And for all who grieve the loss of loved ones or grieve the loss of anything. And let us pray together out loud. We already prayed in our Father to ourselves. Out loud, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, as we gather all of our repentance, all of our thanksgiving, indeed thanksgiving for everything, not just the pleasant things, of our adoration, which belongs only to God, the Trinity, and our petitions that we have not thought of, and our needs, and our, especially our own personal needs. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have opened our hearts to receive your word. And grant that we may learn from your holy scriptures. Make our will strong to put into effect your will. O Holy Spirit, grant us the strength and perseverance to follow wherever you lead. Amen. And let's see who's waving. As I waddle over. Glenn Davis von Felt, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Walter Byrne, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Priscilla Real, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Kate O'Neill, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Wit O Nova, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Father Robert Hart, Christ is in our midst, 
He is and always will be. Courtney Ramsdell, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Adam Bernica Sr., Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Well, God bless you, and let's continue to pray for each other. Remember to wear your masks when you're near people and to keep your social distance. Aloha.